When I was a child, I had a dream that almost all the girls wanted to be a singer. But as the time passed, I changed my idea for something that I thought I would love to do, acting. When I was 14 years old, I was watching my favorite TV show, Stranger Things, and I was fascinated by Millie Bobby Brown, who plays Eleven, and her ability to get into the character. I feel it's difficult sometimes to understand my own feelings, and if you are an actress, you have to feel and understand the feelings of the character. I was Welcome to Happiness and the City. This is Barbara, and today I'd like us to focus on a topic that is very important. And the topic is ownership. There is a lot of confusion in the world today over this issue of ownership. And we need to have more clarification because what is happening right, right now is a fight for whatever is available without any respect paid to um, traditional cultural uh, ownership norms. And we need to have the right order of things in this area or uh, the young generation that is being brought up in this very strange uh, attitude to ownership is going to be very unhappy and very um, insecure and unsafe. There is a lot of focus on the sense of security and, sa and safety in terms of what a person says currently. But this is really wrong because unless a, an individual has an office with uh, power and authority to enforce the content of words, Everything else is just free speech. And that's why we have that uh, distinction between authority and common um, speech. Because if common speech becomes of the same weight as authority, then it, cre it creates a very strange situation in which people who have no authority are treated as if they had authority and they are being silenced because they actually have no authority. Do you see how crazy it is? It is really um, not the right uh, way to organize social communication. Uh, let's look at what uh, Wikipedia says here. Ownership. Ownership is the state or fact of exclusive rights and control of a property which may be an object, land, real estate or intellectual property. Ownership involves multiple rights collectively referred to as title, which may be separated and held by several parties. And then there's just a lot of uh, uh, development of those ideas. I encourage you to read and think about that article because they also say that the process and the mechanics of ownership are fairly complex. One can gain, transfer, lose ownership of property in a number of ways. And I'd like us to focus a little bit on the fact of ownership in relationship to the state or fact of exclusive rights and control over property. So we have um, a, the, the notion of rights here, rights and control. What happened today is the notion of property started to ignore the traditional uh, content of birthrights. And birthrights are connected with what we inherit from our parents, grandparents, and down the road. Um, I'll give you an example. I have a very complex ethnic um, situation, and it's very easy for me to be an American because of that. But when I was in Europe, I was in a very um, um, uneasy situation about my relationship to many countries, but historically the heritage from my family connected me to many countries. And 
I found a way out of it by promoting multinational corporations, good international relations, many connections between diverse countries. And I think that that created a sense of stability and safety within me that I'm connected to my heritage. And then in the process of um, traveling in the, uh, throughout uh, many countries uh, and in America meeting people who come here from diverse countries, I realized that people from completely different cultures are uh, claiming heritage that comes from a different country or area with which they have nothing in common. So I would talk to them, why are you doing this? And they would say laughingly, they laugh at me because they thought I was naive. They would say, all we do is claim that um, heritage as our property and we don't care about your birthright. And that let me take seriously the notion of birthright. A lot of what we today look at um, uh, fear of immigration or, or fear of uh, many other countries is not really caused by what they do, but by lack of assertion of birthright. And I'll give you an example. I was born in Gdansk, Danzig, very complex uh, history of a city that was um, deeply connected with Roman Empire a thousand years ago, um, had um, a lot of uh, development of um, monasteries and military orders like uh, Teutonic Knights, um, uh, banking orders like Templar Knights and monks. Um, Jagiellonian fighters connected to Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which at the beginning, before it was a Commonwealth, when Poland was a kingdom, was connected to Roman Empire. So you see the connection between the heritage of the city where I was born and empire that is thousand years old and has tremendous significance for heritage of Christians and Jews and Arabs because they were connected uh, through the empire today Turks and what seems to be heritage from one city it within my soul and my spirit and my bloodline is very complex heritage and if I ignore it I become very weak. Now, can you imagine someone comes from a different continent and says, hey, um, this heritage is mine. And I say, how? And they say, we'll just take over your house and you will not be able to develop the content of your heritage because we will put your heritage under our property rights. So here we have a situation that God actually forbids because God says thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house nor anything that belongs um, to your neighbor. And I think that the focus that is today on the so-called copyrights, um, human rights, all kinds of rights and ignoring birthright is weakening social relationships and weakening um, connections uh, between rightful ownership and claimed ownership that excludes life and bloodlines and just focuses on property. And I think that if we understand how powerful it is to have the right organization in that area will create peace in the world because if I claim my um, heritage rights from where I was born 
and from the families I was born to that creates peace within me and a sense of security and safety. If someone were to come to me and say, no, no, that house belongs to me. And I say, well, you are not part of my family. You, you are not connected to my parents, my grandparents, other family members. Why would you claim what is rightfully my birthright? And I've been in situations that people would say, we'll do it because we can. And I say, why? Because you're not defending yourself. You're not defending the birthright. In other words, I was dealing with cultures who knew the weakness of not defending birth rights as um, an opportunity to take, it, to take over the fruits of that birthright. Now, look at security thinking in America, Europe. You don't hear anything about it. The only place that really pays attention to it somewhat is um, royal family in Great Britain because they understand the continuity of houses as birthrights. But when you look everywhere else, people just totally ignore it. And then young people are born to situations in which they are not affirmed in their birthright and they become very unhappy. And um, I decided to develop some talks on that because I want um, to restore the power and value of birthright. Birthright strengthens the blood, which means that a person has more ability um, and authority to take care of herself and himself within what they can control. Because as you uh, heard from this definition, claiming ownership means also applying control over the property or over that ownership. So if young generation is not taught to connect to the, the birthright, then some other people come in and take it over that young generation loses control over their lives and their bodies and their ability to um, search within themselves about the identity that is rightfully theirs that comes from within. So this is very important and has very important consequences. And when you start applying value to birthright, first of all, you honor your mother and your father. You start looking at your family members as um, valuable people in your life. You understand that the connections there, bloodline connections that are so powerful that nothing can break them. And then you start developing a sense of loving community in the notion of security and safety. And from that foundation, we develop friends and other connections. But if that foundation is not there, the person's blood becomes very weak, heart sinks, um, the person cannot really connect to the um, content of heritage, to the content of the past, on they can build uh, the present and future and those people become uh, weak and also then they don't get the independence because we are people that are created here through reproductive system so if that is eliminated as um, sense of security and safety within us to help us understand ourselves from what we get through that uh, bloodline heritage, then anything we do outside is disconnected from us. We'll never get strength. And that creates panic, um, social anxieties, all kinds of strange things that um, 
lead many people to start losing will to live and will to love. And that is not good. Um, I've been reading statistics about number of young people going into deep depression. I was totally shaken by a young woman in Belgium that um, um, took her own life because of some trauma that happened to her. A uh, big trauma happened to me a long time ago when I was an active reporter for the Washington Post. And the upbringing that I got to honor, your, to honor my uh, family and to honor God created a sense of duty within me to overcome that trauma, to do anything I can to um, uh, honor the life that they gave me and that, uh, that God shields. So the, the way in which my generation was brought up was to do everything we can to fight for life, to defend life, to defend faith, but not to succumb to some um, bad events or uh, unhappy situations, but to overcome them, to uh, find ways around them if there are obstacles, and uh, to look at life as a sort of um, um, way to navigate uh, diverse ways in which we have to uh, live, but to continue what our ancestors gave us and what God develops through his uh, guidance and his love. And the young generation, I don't understand why, was brought up in that spirit of claiming something from others, who are not the family usually, um, and some of those people did something bad to them, but the, the, the claim is disconnected from the own bloodline. So they don't connect to what is rightfully theirs, and then they are taught to claim, attack, take to courts people who did something wrong to them or uh, who are perceived as um, uh, uh, people who should give them some money. And that is not going to create strong generation. That is creating that weakness in which uh, many young people are simply uh, focusing their will on lives of other people, not on their own life. And then they have a hard time to even understand what love is. Biblically, love your God first, and then love others as you love yourself. In other words, connecting to God immediately makes you love yourself because God, God's presence within you is pure love and his love is so overpowering that you love yourselves because you feel his love in you and then you love others. But if you don't have that love from God in which you can love yourself, how can you love others? If you hate yourself, you will hate others. If you always claim something from other people and abandon your own family, you will just end up in this emptiness and hole of despair. So the, the whole notion of ownership has to be looked at first at what we have within our bloodline, the ownership of ourselves. When people affirm and assert the importance of bloodline, the first thing they fight for is right to liberty. Why? Because we are all different. We come from different family, every, families. Everybody is an, an individual. Everybody looks different, and that is just the way God designed us. So when we affirm the individuality of ourselves in our ownership of ourselves, then we create a sense of security, safety from desires of other people to own us. There is a very subtle form of slavery existing today in which people don't own other people directly, 
but as I was explaining to you at the beginning, they own the properties and they try to take over their heritage. So in a way, they create um, slaves out of them if they survive this. Some people don't survive that. So we are looking at the need to restore a sense of security and safety around matters of ownership. Um, a lot of uh, social media um, talks today focus on current speech, but there seems to be a certain disconnect from the entire heritage of the United States of America, which from the beginning was based on God's love, freedom to preach, which uh, eventually was um, codified as freedom to speech, and um, for conversations and communications um, to be um, f as free as, as free citizens can be. So we have freedom throughout all citizens, and then of course there are some people who have offices, who have certain authorities connected with offices, and their words have a different power because they can have social consequences through rules, regulations, or laws. But all of the other people who don't have connection to any particular um, office should just be allowed to do whatever they want so long as they don't um, do something um, criminal like killing other people. They can talk, they can search for truth, they can um, uh, like people or not like them. There are situations which people like each other for a while, then they get tired of each other, they go to a different group, sometimes they come back. The only group of people you always are connected to is your bloodline family and very good friends if you are lucky to have them. So we have to come back to the sense of ownership of our bloodline heritage. And ever since I decided to do it consciously, because I was in danger of losing it, I started developing strength and health, because my body can control what is rightfully mine. And people who claim what is birthright of other people, they often end up in bad health or uh, in some strange situations and they um, try to control this and then they can't, but they think that controlling this as property right will solve the situation, but it will just make it worse. worse. And this is what is happening right now. So many people ignored the right order of things through bloodlines and they just focused on um, ownership of property and control of properties connected to those bloodlines with, to which they have um, no rightful connection and then they go into spiral of control and that controlling spirit right now is um, out of bounds. So many people want to control what is happening in social media. Please don't. This is the realm of free speech. And until there is a situation in which um, there is a certain governmental office or court organized that would have power to um, enforce certain decisions, um, that would be different. Um, a way of looking at media, but if this is just a social way of talking like we used to in bars uh, and now we have social media and in bars of course you talk and get beer, get drunk, talk more, people would say the most outrageous things. I, I remember this from the times when I was in college and we would have uh, great times together and the memory of those times are very powerful in my mind. 
Today, if the same speech would be applied to social media, immediately some people would come in and try to control it. And those people who, most people who write for social media are not even drunk. They are just trying to connect with other people like we used to do in bars. So that controlling spirit didn't exist when I was in college. And now it exists and needs to stop because that is the violence that controlling spirit creates disruption of what is the rightful bloodline heritage of Americans and then also people connected to that heritage to have free speech and enjoy it and have fun with it, okay? One day you develop ideas about Machiavelli, another day you meet a preacher who persuades you to read the Bible, so you talk to people about the Bible. That's fine, that's how it should be. We should just be as able as possible to develop ideas, to connect our abilities to talk to one another, to develop our intellect through that freedom of speech, and not to be burdened by responsibilities of power and authority that are in a different realm, in the realm of offices. And then offices should be also organized in a loving and beautiful way and within the limit of what is appropriate for them. They should not try to take over control of all social media because then they violate the very birthright of freedom of speech that is the right to liberty of America.